Thank you. Welcome again. We're coming to an end to this series of lectures. Um, and tonight we're going to do the intestines. After that, uh, that um, hellish time in the stomach yesterday, I hope all of you felt it. Um, there's somebody very important in the audience tonight. Now, all of you are important, but there's somebody extremely important, and I'm going to be talking about him. So I'll be putting up some of his pictures, and I hope he approves. But I'll tell you about him as we go on. So we're now going into the intestines. So just to remind you that we finished with the stomach, and we're actually moving <laughs> down, down the gut. So we're going to talk about the small intestine. And then we're going to say something about the liver, my favorite organ, how it breaks down and builds up many biological molecules. It stores vitamins and iron, destroys old blood cells, it destroys poisons, mild aids in digestion, and of course, connected to the liver is the gallbladder. And then we'll talk a bit about this other remarkable organ, the pancreas, okay? Now it says here, hormones regulate the Pancreatic hormones regulate blood glucose levels. The bicarb it secretes, secretes neutralizes stomach acid. It secretes some very powerful enzymes, trypsin and chymotrypsin. Amylase digests polysaccharides, and lipase digests lipids. OK. So just let's look at the small intestine. It's six to seven meters long from the pyloric sphincter to the ileocecal valve. So the pyloric sphincter is the sphincter that closes off the stomach. And it's got three major subdivisions, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Okay? So this is where we're going to be living tonight. <laughs> so if you look at that diagram, there's the duodenum it's coming from the stomach, the jejunum, and the ileum. Okay? And that other part there, is the large intestine. OK. Now, let's just go back to the stomach. There's two very important things that happen before the food gets from the stomach to the duodenum. And that is gastric emptying and mixing. Now, yesterday we, 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 we dwelled upon what goes on in the stomach. And we spoke about very potent hydrochloric acid, we spoke about how that hydrochloric acid activates pepsin, a powerful enzyme which breaks down protein into peptides, right? Peptides are shorter protein segments. And then we spoke about the remarkable protect, pro, uh, protection of the epithelial layer by the layer of mucus. And so you all know now about mucus. Now, by the time this food is ready to leave the stomach, it's pulped. It's chime. So no matter how tough that piece of steak that you've eaten, it actually leaves the stomach as a fluid substance. And, and that I find remarkable, because it all happens without us being totally aware of it. Now, we spoke in the first lecture about this wave of muscular action that goes right from the esophagus right down to the anus, which is called peristalsis. And in this particular case, so it's, it's described by that blue arrow. In this particular case, it, it says a, peristal, a peristaltic contraction originates in the upper fundus and sweeps down towards the pyloric sphincter. Upper fundus down to the pyloric sphincter, right over there. Now, the contraction becomes more vigorous as it reaches the thick muscled antrum. That antrum is a part of the stomach, but it's thicker, its walls are thicker than the other parts of the stomach. Now, the strong antral peristaltic contraction propels the chyme forward. So the chyme has nowhere to go but to the duodenum, right? And the small portion of chyme is pushed through the partially open sphincter into the duodenum. The stronger the antral contraction, uh, contraction, the more the chyme that gets into the duodenum. But that makes sense, because you're propelling forward, OK? But sometimes there's some mixing. When the peristaltic contraction reaches the pyloric sphincter, right? 
and the sphincter is tightly closed, then emptying can't take place. When that kind that was being propelled forward hits the closed sphincter, it is tossed back into the antrum, so it goes back. So there's a bit of mixing here in this area. Ultimately, ultimately, the chyme moves forward. It's propelled into the duodenum. So mixing of chyme is accomplished as chyme is propelled forward and tossed back into the antrum with each peristaltic contraction. Now, another remarkable point is this is the antrum, and it's right there next to the duodenum. But the difference in environment between these two areas is absolutely fascinating. Remember, this area is hot. It's got very potent acid. What is going to happen when this kind now, mixed with acid, moves into the duodenum? OK. So once it gets into the small intestine, it's with different types of cells. You don't find these cells in the stomach. These are absorptive cells. The cells that secrete mucus in the small intestine are called goblet cells. And they increase in number as the small intestine progresses down towards the large intestine. They are enteroendocrine cells. They are T lymphocytes. And they are Brunner's glands, which secrete bicarb-rich mucus to increase the pH of the chyme. Now you're having an idea of the chyme, the food, in its fluid form entering an environment which is totally different from the acidic environment of the stomach. We're now in a region of alkalinity, of bicarb, and it's probably just a few millimeters away. Okay. The villus epithelium is replaced every three to six days, and the intestinal juice is isotonic with blood plasma. That means it's, it has the same pressure as blood plasma. It's slightly alkaline, and it has a low enzyme content. Now, when the food enters the duodenum as chyme, it is mixed with juice secreted by the small intestine cells, like the cells I've just described to you. They secrete something, and the chyme now mixes with that. So the pH, that means the acidity of the chyme, is now beginning to change. Then there are other secretions that come and mix with this chyme from the pancreas. And I'll explain that exocrine pancreas to you just now. The pancreatic juice is alkaline, as opposed to acidic. It's watery. It contains enzymes and electrolytes. And there's another component to this whole thing that comes down here to the duodenum to mix with the food, and that's bile. That's why everything that you sometimes throw up is yellow, because it's tainted with bile, which is yellow. All these secretions are released into the duodenal lumen. Here's the diagram. Now, so that was your stomach. That was the part where the chyme was coming through. It's now coming to the duodenum. And sits, just sitting under the stomach is this absolutely marvelous organ called the pancreas. I'm sure all of you have heard of it. And it's got two portions to it. It has an endocrine portion and an exocrine portion. Now, endocrine meaning that if it secretes something like hormone, it can send that hormone to its destination to any part of its body, or any part of the body. That hormone will get into the bloodstream and head for the hills. It won't necessarily have a local effect. Whereas the exocrine portion here, yeah, Whatever it secretes is used in the proximity of the pancreas, right? Now, let's look at the endocrine portion. The endocrine portion has these little structures called the islets of Langerhans. And they secrete insulin. And you all know about insulin. Insulin goes into the bloodstream, and it facilitates the movement of glucose into your tissue. And that glucose is vital to all your cells in the body, because that glucose is eventually broken down to form the energy you need so that you can sit here 
and actually listen to me. <laughs> right? So that glucose is a form of energy, but it's not the right form. It has to be broken down and all its energy removed, and another molecule called ATP has to be made. That's something for another summer school session, right? But that glucose is like, it is a form of energy, but it has, it has the same value as dollars in South Africa. If I gave you a hundred dollars, you went to pick and pay, I said, can, can you buy me a Coke? They'll tell you, no, you can't. Never mind it's worth so many thousand rands. It's just not the right currency. But if I give you the money in rands, you'll buy the Coke. The ATP is the rands of the South African cell. <laughs> okay? So that's the endocrine portion. In the exocrine portion, these duct cells here, as I told you, will secrete an aqueous bicarb solution to keep this part, to keep this part of the intestine alkali. And the ASNR cells secrete digestive enzymes, right? So those digestive enzymes also go into, because you need enzymes. Now in the stomach, we had this remarkable enzyme pepsin, which could only work in an acidic environment and it broke down protein. Now, in the small intestine, you're going to have other enzymes, not pepsin. Pepsin, won't, pepsin will die here. It doesn't like an alkaline environment. It needs an acidic environment. So the enzymes of choice here, nature's choice, are trypsin and chymotrypsin and peptidases, which we'll talk about just now. Okay. Now, this is the pan... I'm sorry, I keep pointing. This is the pancreatic duct. Whatever is secreted into it then goes into the intestine, right? But there's another duct that meets this duct here, forming a common duct. It's like two a slipway and a highway meeting and forming a common road. So that is a, the common part of that duct. So the other duct is the bile duct, and that comes from the liver. So just to put you in context again, we're in this region, OK? Now, let's look at the pancreas and the stomach and the bile duct all together. So what do we have? We have the duodenum, which curves around the pancreatic head. This is the pancreatic head. The duodenum curves, curves around there. It contains the hepatopancreatic ampulla formed by the merger of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct. Can you see that? Bile duct, pancreatic duct, form a merger and then form a common duct. In the pig, they're separate. That's one of the differences. They enter the duodenum individually. Here, they enter as one duct, all right? So you have the merger of this. And the hepatopancreatic sphincter, these sphincters crop up everywhere. They're extremely important. They're pressure sensitive. They're sensitive to chemicals. They open when they need to. Otherwise, they remain closed. They're very well behaved. So those, unless as you get older, your sphincters get weaker. So the hepatocratic sphincter controls admission of bile and pancreatic enzymes to the duodenum. OK, so let's look at the pancreatic phase of secretion. So I told you, your chymes in your duodenum, the duodenal cells that line the wall of the duodenum have contributed their secretions to the chyme. But now let's see what the pancreas, let's see what the pancreas is going to secrete. So it's both an endocrine and an exocrine organ. The islets of Langerhans secrete insulin to ensure that your blood sugar levels remain at a particular level that you don't have hyperglycemia for too long after a meal. The insulin ensures that your sugar in your blood goes into cells. Now, the exocrine portion secretes pancreatic juice, which is enzyme-rich and alkali, and it's an alkali bicarb secretion. So the pH of this region has to change. Now the pH is high. Yesterday the pH was coming down to pH 2 or pH 1 in the stomach, meaning that the concentration of acid is very strong. Today 
This is an extremely weak acid. It's more basic. Now you've got the enzymes that are secreted into the duodenum are called trypsin, chymotrypsin, and peptidases. They're the serine family of proteolytic enzymes. They, they secreted in an inactive form, and they're absolutely specific. This is one of the most marvelous things. It, it, it's unbelievable. Enzyme activity is one of the most fascinating things. If I took this, what do you call this, the pointer, and put it there, and I said to you that it's favorable, it's favorable that this pointer, if left there, for a certain period of time, will degrade. All right? So I'll come back a week later, it'll still look the same. I might come back five years later, it'll still look the same. If I came back 50 years later, there might be some kind of degradation. It might lose its function, right? Now, so that's favorability. Now, if I told you that the food you eat and that gets into your system, into your stomach, it's favorable that that f food will will eventually degrade into little bits, right? But you can't wait for 50 years. <laughs> you can't sit and wait and say, no, I'll have to wait for my protein to break and into <laughs> amino acids and get digested so that it can get absorbed into the bloodstream eventually. You can't wait. And that's the function of an enzyme. It catalyzes reactions. Um, simul you know, it's almost like simultaneous. The minute the enzyme meets, its substrate, which is protein. The enzyme itself is a form of protein. It meets its substrate in the stomach and in the small intestine, and it breaks it up into little bits. So it's not only favorable, it happens very quickly. It's a catalyst. And what happens after the reaction is the protein will break up, but the enzyme is intact, ready for the next round. That's how fascinating this is. And now, if you say, I've got three kinds of enzymes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and peptidases. They are the serine family of proteolytic. Lytic means to cleave. So they are a family of cleavers, like a pair of scissors, right? But if you, if you look at scissors, they could come in different shapes and sizes, but they perform the same function. But these are specific. They will look at a peptide, and this particular one will say, I like amino acids that are basic, so it will go to that very exact point in the peptide where there's a basic amino acid and cleave it there, and in no other spot. The chymotrypsin will do the same, but in another area. It says, I like amino acids that are aromatic, and it would go there and cleave that at that, at that exact spot. So the peptide gets broken into little bits. Eventually, it gets broken into its basic components, which are amino acids. Right? Now, enzymes come in different families, and enzymes are proteins that have an active site where the catalysis takes place. So at that active site, a substrate binds, and that substrate is cut. Right? So if you've got a family of enzymes that have serine in its active site, then that is the serine family. It's like a surname, right? It's my family. They're all malls, OK? Uh, so it's like that in this particular case. All these enzymes are serine proteases. Ases meaning they are enzymes that cleave, OK? Very, very specific. Now. Then there's pancreatic amylase and lipase. And amylase cleaves any sugars that come in there, any polysaccharides. And the lipase is to cleave lipids, right? So there's a lot of activity here. And then I told you in my first lecture that when you're looking at an organ, you can't actually see, look at it in isolation. If you took an organ out of your body and put it here, it becomes worthless. In the body, it has to have a blood supply so it gets nutrients and oxygen. It has to be innervated by nerves so it can function. And it has to have a hormonal supply. 
And that organ then is part of a system, and that system communicates with other systems to keep you whole and alive as a homeostatically regulated organism. Okay? So, two hormones are released by the presence of chyme in the duodenum, CCK and secretin. Secretin controls the release of the bicarb, so everything is actually controlled. You're a regulated being. Imagine if there's no regulation. Imagine if, well, I think this is a bad example. I was going to say the taxis in Cape, of Cape Town. <laughs> Imagine if, if a taxi driver was driving down Main Road and suddenly said, I think there might be passengers in Fish Hook. Let me turn around and go and fetch them. So he goes completely out of his route. Now imagine if all the taxis in one morning did that. There'd be chaos in Cape Town. So you have to regulate. The taxi industry regulates the movement of the taxis. You take a taxi from Weinberg to go to Cape Town, not to Simonstown. That's kind of strict regulation. The body follows that kind of principle. It's a regulated, we are regulated organisms, okay? So secretin controls the release of bicarb-rich secretion to neutralize any acid that might still be present with the chyme, and the cholecystokinin controls the release of the digestive enzymes. So essentially, if you look up there, during the cephalic and gastric phases, that means when you're thinking of food, stimulation by the vagal nerve fibers causes the release of pancreatic juice and also causes weak contractions of the gallbladder, right? So the acidic chyme from the stomach enters the duodenum and causes the enteroendocrine cells of the duodenal wall to release secretin, whereas fatty protein-rich chyme induces the release of cholecystokinin. See, everything is done in order. The cholecystokinin and secretin enter bloodstream. Upon, so when they enter the bloodstream, they're all here now, upon reaching the bloodstream, they, reach, they then go to the pancreas, and cholecystokinin induces the secretion of enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. Secretin causes copious secretion of the bicarb-rich pancreatic juice. Can you imagine this? We are amazing machines at every level. And how old are we? The first cell appeared on this planet four billion years ago. In four billion years, you've got these conscious machines inhabiting this planet. It's, a, it's absolutely amazing. So just to summarize, cholecystokinin is, an, is a hormone that's released in response to fats and protein. It stimulates pancreatic secretion of enzymes. Secretin is a hormone that's released in response to acid. It stimulates pancreatic duct cells to release bicarb, to neutralize all acid in the duodenum, creating a completely different environment for the food. Now let's look at this other remarkable organ called the gallbladder. So as I told you, the gallbladder is linked to the liver. Okay, so the gallbladder's duct, and of course other biliary ducts coming from the liver, form a common bile duct, and then come and join up with the pancreatic duct, and then they release their bile salts. Together with the pancreatic juice, bile salts are released into the duodenum. Okay, now, this is quite, quite a, a, a circus, if you think about it. Because look, your bile salts are made in the liver, right? And then they actually go from the liver to the duodenum, as I've shown you. They get involved in the digestive process, okay? And the products of digestion then, when they get absorbed into the bloodstream, go back via the portal vein back to the liver to be detoxified. Okay. Now, so just to put everything in context, there's your liver, there's your gallbladder, there's your stomach, there's your pancreas, and there's your in small intestine. So that's where we are. So the liver makes bile, and the gallbladder stores the bile. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a bit about this remarkable organ. Now, when I joined uh, UCT's Department of Surgery many, many moons ago, uh, I actually joined a unit called the MRC Liver Research Unit. So it was a unit that overlapped between the Department of Surgery um, and the Department of Medicine. 
Okay. Now, there were two directors at that time. The head of medicine was Professor Ralph Kirsch, and the head of surgery was Professor John Tablanche. Right, so they were the directors. Eventually, uh, Ralph Kirsch died, uh, John Tablanche retired, and the, new, the following, the, the next director of the unit is sitting in the audience tonight. And you're gonna get to know him just now. But let's just talk about the liver, functions of the liver. They say life depends on the liver. The largest and the most important metabolic organ in the body, right? I think some water would be nice. You don't mind a little break, do you? Okay. Okay, so it's the largest and most important metabolic organ in the body. It's the body's major biochemical factory. It makes some serum proteins, right? like albumin, made in the liver. It processes carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids after the absorption from the digestive tract. I just showed that to you just now, that the bile enters the duodenum, the digestion takes place, and, 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 and the products of the digestion go back via the portal circulation to the liver. So when we talk about absorption of nutrients into the bloodstream, we're talking about blood of the portal circulation that first leads to the liver. Now, why should it go to the liver? Because the liver detoxifies and degrades body wastes and hormones as well as drugs and other, other foreign compounds. And there's a special enzyme system in the liver that does this. It's called the cytochrome P450 system. Problem with that system is in the, in the process of trying to de toxify something and make it harmless, it sometimes creates a metabolite like a free radical that can be harmful. So it's a bit of a risk. Okay. Now, the liver activates vitamin D, which the liver accomplishes in conjunction with the kidneys. The removal of bacteria and worn out red blood cells, thanks to its resident macrophages, right? So it's got, a, it's got an immune function. It excretes cholesterol and bilirubin, the latter being a breakdown product from the destruction of worn out red blood cells. Can you have, imagine one organ having all these functions? And I'm not listing all of them. Storage of fats, iron, copper, and vitamins. Bile synthesis, which actually then goes into the bile duct. And a lot of the bile is stored in the gallbladder and when more bile is needed, the gallbladder releases it into the duodenum, okay? And people suffer from biliary stasis. It is one of the common conditions where the bile duct gets blocked, okay? And sometimes people have gallstones in the stomach. There's a prairie dog in North America. If you feed it a high cholesterol diet, it will form gallstones. And, of course, the storage of glycogen, right? Now, that, these are the functions of the liver. Glycogen storage, glucose production and distribution, and gluconeogenesis is one of the sections I teach medical students in biochemistry, and it's absolutely fascinating. I told you, when you have a meal, and then in your intestine you break down your sugars, your complex sugars, and you produce glucose, and the glucose gets absorbed into the bloodstream, so your concentration of glucose in the blood suddenly rises, right? So if you if you diabetic, it's, it's futile for you to have a sh blood sugar test after a meal. You have to have it when you're starved to get a proper indication of how much blood sugar you have in your blood, right? So the blood sugar rises after a meal, and then in the pancreas secretes this hormone called insulin, which facilitates, as I said, the glucose to get into cells for the purpose of energy. So what happens in every cell in your body, and the brain actually depends entirely on glucose for energy, right? Okay. And so in every one of your cells, you have a process called glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose to produce energy. Okay. So that's glycolysis. Now, 
What does it form eventually? ATP, the energy currency of the cell. And that is what allows this gentleman to actually hold his head like this. Because if he didn't have enough ATP, these muscles won't play the game and he won't be able to be sitting in that position. Okay, it's simple as that. Okay, now that's glycolysis. Now, this is extremely interesting. It's extremely interesting. Now, say I, all of you have had supper at the same time. And I kept you here until midnight. How will you feel in terms of, will you feel hungry? If you're tired, but you, 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 you would like to eat something. OK, uh, and then I, I said, no, you can't have anything. I'm a very cruel man. You can, you sit here until 3 AM. So if I kept you here until 3 AM, how will you feel? And hungry. OK, so now you'd be in a state, you'd be in a state of early starvation, right? Early starvation. And angry. And angry, yeah. So you'll be consuming more energy. OK, bad for you, that. Anger is bad. Anyway, what do you think happens your blood is flowing through every bit of tissue in your body, and the brain is able to detect that your blood glucose levels are dropping. Does that make sense? That's logical, right? Now, the cells in your body start panicking because they say, we do not have enough glucose for glycolysis. How will this individual be able to stand and walk out of this room? But you'll be able to do that because you've got reserves. <laughs> So all the tissue in the body phone the liver and say to the liver, hey, mate, we have a problem. I think we're running short of glucose. So what the liver says is, don't panic. Remember when you had just eaten, right? All of you got glucose. And I got glucose. And I took the excess. And I joined the glucose units together to make glycogen. Didn't I tell you just now that one of the functions of the liver is the storage of glycogen? Glycogen is glucose in the polymeric form. OK. So what the liver does is it breaks the glycogen into glucose and distributes it to all the tissue. So the brain and the kidneys and all get very happy and say, oh, the liver's very good. But now, I'm not going to still let you eat. I'm going to keep you here until, say, midday tomorrow. Now you're moving into the state of crisis, because the tissue by now are all calling the liver again to do something. And the liver says, just exactly what do you want me to do? I've given you my entire stores of glycogen. What do you want me to do? OK? Now, we re we've reached crisis point. So the liver goes into a completely different state, gluconeogenesis it now starts to synthesize glucose. From non-glucose precursors, neogenesis, a new formation. OK. Now, the interesting thing about that is when you break down a glucose molecule by glycolysis, you get two ATPs. But to make a glucose molecule from non-glucose precursors costs six to eight ATPs. It's an expensive process. Where will the liver, where will the liver, because liver itself is short of glucose, where will it get its energy from now to make glucose? Where? It'll break down fat. It'll break down. That's why by the time I'm finished with you and I let you go, you would have lost a couple of kilos. <laughs> and so will I. Okay. Gluconeogenesis. But that's for, another, that's for another time. Anyway, so the gallbladder is a muscular pouch that stores bile and exp expels bile when needed via the cystic duct and the bile ducts. Right? So it stores and it. Now, biliary stasis is one problem. Sometimes when, when the bile duct gets blocked, the bile starts seeping out. You can see it on a patient who has jaundice. Doctors put in biliary stents to actually widen the bile. Is that an ERCP, Dal? ERCP? But why do you need bile? OK, that's a good question. And gallstones may form if bile contains too much cholesterol, too much bilirubin, or not enough bile salts. Scientists do not fully understand why these imbalances occur. 
Gallstones also may form if the gallbladder does not empty completely or often enough. Okay. Now, let's talk about Anthony Eden and his bile duct. This is a story told by a former colleague and friend, David Dent. Anthony Eden, Eden was the first Earl of Avon. He was a British conservative politician who served three periods as foreign secretary and then a relatively brief term as prime minister of the United Kingdom from 1955 to 1957. Now, on the 26th of July, 1956, Egyptian President Hamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, which was owned by British and France. Britain stole it, I think, from, and France. Eden decides to go to war against Egypt. So this is how they planned it. Israel will invade the Sinai, OK? And Britain and France would come in as peacekeepers and reclaim the Suez. The war lasted six days. Dwight Eisenhower was furious with Anthony Eden. He said, I must tell you that the American public opinion flatly rejects the use of force, OK? Russia threatened to come to the help of Egypt. So Eden now had provoked a nuclear superpower. The USA starts to sell their sterling bond holdings, causing the pound to fall. So that was a punishment for the, for the British. But why such brinkmanship from Eden? Now, there's many theories. But one of the theories is that Eden had an illness, and it influenced his foreign policy catastrophe. So in 1953, Eden developed symptomatic gallstones. So he must have had a lot of cholesterol in his diet. So his physician, Sir Horace Evans, suggested three expert surgeons. Said, uh, Prime Minister, these three are the best in the UK, and they could treat you for your gallstones. Usually, they remove the gallbladder. It's called a cholecystic to me. But Eden said, no, I want Mr. John Basil Hume because he's the man who removed my appendix when I was six years old. <laughs> now, Hume was an old man now. And he was very nervous because Churchill kept reminding him, remember, Eden is a very eminent man. And they say Hume was so nervous that, one, at one, that in the theater, he actually had to take about an hour to you know, recover. So the common bile duct was inadvertently tied off, and a second operation had to be performed by Guy Blackburn, OK? So Evans, uh, Hume didn't deliver the goods. So the, the second guy, Guy Blackburn, he actually <laughs> cut the bile duct. He said the knife had slipped. <laughs> and now Eden was in real trouble. They had to call in an American surgeon, Richard Cato, from the Leahy Clinic in Boston. And he said, I'll only do the op if I can take Eden to the United States. That, and he took Eden to the United States, and he did a hepatojujanostomy. That means he joined the bowel to the bile duct stumps. You know the stumps that remained after the, the, the cutting of the bile duct? He joined that to the intestine. So the bile could still flow to the intestine. <clears throat> right. Churchill was furious with him. He said to Cattle, you do this operation in England. Remember that King George III was operated upon on a kitchen table in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> And Kettle said, no ways. You want me to do, you want me to reverse this damage. I'm taking the patient to North America. Eden became well, and he succeeded Churchill as prime minister. OK? Eden was on medication after that. But before the Suez crisis, it's been reported that Eden became tired. He became feverish. He was in pain, and he had cholangitis. That means infection of the bile ducts. He had high temperature. He had to take barbiturates to sleep at night and amphetamines to keep him awake in the day. He also took drinamyl, an amphetamine and amylobarbitone combination, often referred to as purple hearts. Amphetamines produced a feeling of energy and confidence, but developed tolerance and require higher doses. They were banned in 19, 1964. Sorry. These are my amphetamines. <laughs> now, what happened after that? They can produce anxiety, 
insomnia, overconfidence, and irritability. Eden was self-medicating from his well-known black pill box. And days before the crisis, he became elated, talkative, like a prophet inspired. His private secretary, John Colville, said that. And he brushed aside counter-arguments and, uh, and influenced his cabinet to go with him. He kept the Suez invasion a secret for many others in his cabinet. It reminded me of somebody else. <laughs> Eden was the last prime minister to believe that Britain was a great power and the first to confront a crisis that proved that she was not. This was the, in the obituary of the Times after he died. What was the excuse of the French then? <laughs> I will tell you later. OK. Now, one of the most fascinating things about the liver that I didn't tell you about was that it can regenerate. Liver regeneration. Now, liver regeneration has evolved to protect animals in the wild from the catastrophic results of liver loss that can be caused by ingested toxins. The process has been recognized by scientists for many years and was even described by the ancient Greeks who mentioned liver regeneration in the myth of Prometheus. Having stolen the secret of fire from the gods of Olympus, Prometheus drew down on himself the anger of Zeus, the ruler of gods and men. Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining him to Mount Caucasus, where he was tormented by an eagle. The eagle preyed on Prometheus' liver, which was renewed as fast as, as fast as it was devoured. Now, this was in Nature by Rebecca Taub. But Professor Del Khan, my colleague and friend, my head of department, he was telling me today, he said, imagine liver regeneration has been known since Greek times. Prometheus, a titan who was at war with Greek gods, then defected to them, and he stole their fire, which is actually knowledge, a symbol for knowledge, from the gods and gave it to common people. This angered Zeus and other gods, tied him to a rock and cut a piece in his side, and the vultures fed on his liver, but it grew as it was eaten. eaten. The fascinating thing about this is, we are now in the 21st century, we still don't know what switches on the regenerative mechanism and what switches it off. We know many of the growth factors involved, but little else. If we could know what switched regeneration on, we could help patients with acute liver failure and chronic cirrhosis. The cell turnover during regeneration is faster than in cancer. Imagine you start it, and you st it stops at a certain time. So if you cut, if you had to do a live-related transplant, you took a lobe from the father and put it into the child. That liver will grow in the child and become a fully-fledged liver as the child grows and then stop there. It's amazing. And here's poor old Prometheus sitting there watching his liver being chewed. And so I want to introduce to you Professor Del Khan, who's in the audience tonight, sitting right back. He'll sign autographs after this talk. <laughs> He's our head of department. He was the head uh, of the transplant division, too. And Del Khan has been an amazing clinician, an amazing researcher. And, and his latest uh, thing under his belt is that he's a distinguished teacher. OK. Now, the story of liver transplant started with this man here, Thomas Starzl, who first worked in Denver, Colorado, and then in Pittsburgh, he established this transplant unit in Pittsburgh, in the USA. And he was an amazing man. And Professor Del Khan, from the University of Cape Town, worked for Starzl, trained under him for a year. But what happened in South Africa is that the first liver transplant was done by Bertie Meiberg at Witz. It wasn't very successful. When Del Khan was leaving for Pittsburgh, John Tablan started a transplant unit here, a liver transplant program. John Tablanche's um, liver transplants were not terribly successful. And Del Khan came back. He did the first successful liver transplant. Any of you with liver problems, speak to Del Khan. He's in the back row. 
This is Roy Khan, not the Del Khan, that's K-A-H-N. This is Roy Khan, C-A-L-N-E, who established a huge liver transplant program at Cambridge University. So these are the big names in transplantation in the world. And we are to be very proud that this university has produced some of the best. Of course, you know, we did the world's first heart transplant. And uh, Del Khan has done any number of kidney transplants, so he's just a transplant man. There's a donor shortage. There's a donor shortage, and organs are very hard to come by. So live-related transplantation, is, when it comes to the liver, seems to work very well. Okay. Now, let's talk about digestion in the small intestines. Let's just talk about digestion of the main foods, the fats, carbohydrates, and the proteins. Now, the human intestine can be considered a bioreactor. If you ingest carbohydrates as polysaccharides, the more the bacteria we have, we come into the bacteria story now, the more the fermentation of these carbohydrates. The bacteria ferment the carbohydrates, and this forms short-chain fatty acids, which meet 5 to 15% of our energy requirements. We, we, each one of us, has 20 genes to make protein that would break down carbohydrates. One species of bacteria, Bacteroides fragilis, that reside in the intestines, have 260 genes to help to process and extract the maximum amount of energy from polysaccharides. Isn't that amazing, these bacteria? So it's a bioreactor. And this I got, of course, from Simon Carden, who you, you'll hear about a lot tomorrow. Now, so we are digesting specific good food groups, and digestion and breaking down is called catabolism as opposed to anabolism. You're breaking down food molecules to its basic units, and the enzymes break these molecules by hydrolysis, sorry, which means adding water to a molecular bond. Okay? So carbohydrates are complex sugars, are broken down to simple sugars. The simple sugars are called monosaccharides, and they're glucose, fructose, and galactose, and they can be absorbed. Now, once, the once you've produced the glucose, and it's a monomer now, it's ready to be absorbed, and it's very essential that it becomes absorbed, because all your tissue, including your brain cells, are waiting for this glucose. But it's not so easy for the glucose to cross that barrier of cells of the wall of the intestine and get into the bloodstream. It's highly problematic. So I want to explain that. So just imagine that this is a cell in the wall of your gut, right? And it's waiting to receive this glucose. And the glucose is standing in the lumen saying, now, I need to get into that cell. Because once I'm in that cell, then I can get into the blood. OK. But now the glucose has a problem. Its concentration in the lumen is lower than its concentration in that cell and in the blood and things can't move against a concentration gradient if they don't have energy. Now, every one of your cells is surrounded, is surrounded by a positive charge because they have sodium. So there's a high concentration of sodium outside the cell. And what would that sodium do? It would love to travel down its concentration gradient and diffuse into the cell. So it keeps doing that. And what does the cell do? It says, sodium, get out. It uses energy. It uses ATP to push the sodium out. Then the sodium slides back in, and the cell uses energy to push it out. Each time the cell has to push sodium out, it uses an ATP molecule. So it uses energy. OK? So it's an energy gradient. It's not a problem moving in because things move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. It's a problem moving out, and then the cell provides the energy to push it out again. Now, the glucose stands and watches this and gets an idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually slide down that gradient. So it makes friends with the sodium that's sliding down, and it gets into the cell against its own concentration gradient. Once it's inside, sodium and the glucose part ways, the sodium has to be pushed out of the cell again by energy. The glucose finds a way of getting from that cell into the bloodstream, into the portal circulation, to go to the liver and to all parts of your body. 
Does that make sense? OK. Right. Now, look at proteins. Proteins can be broken down into amino acids. So protein digestion started with pepsin in the stomach. Then you had trypsin in the small intestine. Then you had chymotrypsin. Then you had peptidases. So you're cutting, 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 cutting this protein until you got it down to its basic building blocks. And, and, why have I got that? OK. OK, so those amino acids can be easily absorbed. The other problem is how do you absorb fat? Fat is a bugger to absorb. OK, so now let's look at fat. Fat, fat is actually triglyceride, right? Fatty acids and glycerol make a fat molecule called tri triglyceride. And that triglyceride is like a drop of oil. You drop a drop of oil into a beaker of water, doesn't dissolve. You'll see the oil, right? It's hydrophobic, doesn't like water, keeps away from water. But now it's in, in the container with water, can't hide, but it keeps to itself, right? Now, the same thing happens in the gut. You got the triglyceride there, and it's hydrophobic because it doesn't like the hydrophilic or the polar environment of the gut. So it tries to sit in the, in the lumen of the gut, minding its own business. But the body needs it for energy. Now the lipase, which breaks down the triglyceride, the lipase, which breaks down the triglyceride to fatty acids and glycerol, can't get to it because the lipase likes a hydrophilic water-loving molecule, not a hydrophobic, water-hating molecule. OK, so this is where your bile salts from your gallbladder come in, that enter the duodenum via the bile duct, or the common bile duct. Remember that? The bile salts have two faces. They have a hydrophobic face, and they have a hydrophilic face. They take the hydrophobic face, and surround it adjacent to the triglyceride, and they surround it. So they bluff the environment that the triglyceride inside is actually hydrophilic. So the lipase then attacks that and gets in and breaks the fat down into its components, fatty acid and glycerol. Right. Those get absorbed into the cell, but what happens? It gets into the cell of the wall of the gut, and it reforms the triglyceride. Now you've got the same problem. That triglyceride is not going into the blood. It just hates a watery environment. So what that cell does is it adds components to it, like proteins, cholesterol, and things that will give it a hydrophilic characteristic. OK? You call that a chylomicron. And that doesn't go into the blood, it goes into the lymph. And it travels along the lymph and then gets into the blood. And then starts getting broken down again into fatty acid and glycerol. The fatty acid is then transported to our adipocytes. And this is the result. <laughs> they get stored there. They get stored there. OK? This is the result. So when they needed they will be called upon to provide energy. Like when you're running a marathon, and you run out of glucose, the adipocytes play the game and provide you with fatty acid to be able to. Or when you're in gluconeogenesis and energy is needed, the adipocytes will send fatty acids to the liver for energy. OK. Right. Now, so I've, I've said all this. Um, and then now when you, so if you look at it from here, there's the lumen of the intestine here. There's the fatty acids and monoglycerides associated with the micelles. Oh yes, when the bile salts surround the triglyceride, you call it a micelle. So you form the micelle, and then the lipase breaks it down, they go in, and then they leave as chylomicrons into the lymphatic system. All right. Now, Here's the story. To get into the blood, eventually, you get, as I said, into the portal circulation, which then takes everything to the liver. So even if you've ingested aspirin or any medication, everything gets into the portal circulation and goes into the liver. 
eventually the liver does the detoxification, the blood moves on to the heart, and then eventually goes to the lungs to be oxygenated, comes back to the heart, goes to the aorta, and goes to all parts of the body. Okay. Diseases of the intestine, duodenal ulcers, can now be cured by antibiotics. Remember Helicobacter, we spoke about it. There's inflammatory bowel diseases of the colon. I'm not going to discuss them. They um, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. They can be both sporadic and hereditary. Liver diseases, a whole lot of cancers, um, uh, hepatitis B infections, and a, and a cancer of the bile ducts called cholangiocarcinoma, which has a very bad prognosis. Cirrhosis from excessive drinking. Remember, your alcohol heads for your liver, and too much of it then damages the liver. Hepatitis and jaundice we spoke about. And in the gallbladder, you get biliary stasis and gallstones. Good night. <laughs> Del pancreatic cancer. There's this yeah, this is there's several types. There's the adenocarcinoma, which if caught early can is treatable. And then there are and then mucus secreting. Uh, and then there's the cystic neoplasms. Uh, they have bad prognosis, or even the adenocarcinoma, if it's found too late, has a bad prognosis. Usually, usually they can be alcohol-related, right? Damage of the pancreas, but you can get pancreatic cancer sporadically. You can get pancreatic cancer sporadically. Yeah. Yeah. What is the fatty liver as a result of non-alcoholic damage to the liver? It's accumulation of fat in the liver. I, I suppose there's probably lack of liver enzymes or something that don't break the fat down. It, 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 or it, through certain kinds of diets, you can get fatty depo deposit, deposits in the liver. Uh, alcohol can create fatty liver. But I'm not a clinician, so I don't really know very much about this. I don't know. Do you know? Effect of fructose? To fat. And that's what non alcohol that's why there's such a high percentage of non alcohol that we've used in uh, uh, countries where people don't drink alcohol. Don't drink al alcohol because of the diet. Yeah, because of the food choice. Um, you said that the fatty acids go via the lymphatic system. Yeah. How does it get from there into the bloodstream? Well, they all, it's, it's, it's a continuation. They just link up with the bloodstream. Your lymph vessels, lymph, your lymphatic vessels, link up to your bloodstream. I thought they also were involved in drainage. You, they are, but they do transport these chylomicrons too. Yeah. Yes. Leaking gut. Leaking gut. We're going to talk a bit about tomorrow. That's where cells sort of allow become porous. Right? In serious cases, that can be a problem if you start leaking contents of the gut into the bloodstream for infections. Yes? What's the long term effect of the removal of the gallbladder? Nothing. Nothing really. Because the liver continues to make bile. And you remember that duct that came down? The gallbladder is just a storage organ. People can live without a gallbladder. Like you can live without your appendix, but I mean, they're not the same thing. Thank you. I think the, the, the human body, the that part of the body, is quite a miracle system. What I gather now from this is that the body or the, the gut, say that, is equipped to, to deal with a, a very balanced uh, intake of food. And, 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 and so, and it needs sugar, it needs carbohydrates, it needs all these things. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm a little bit confused about people who are advocating uh, uh, <laughs> diet, <laughs> 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 a little bit confused now. 
Listen, he's my friend. I'm not going there at all. <laughs>